Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Garner Ted Armstrong of Ambassador College with The World Tomorrow. In this series of programs, we will tell you something of the problems of the world today, how they will affect you and their solution in The World Tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Ghana Ted Armstrong. A United States of Europe is coming. It's almost here, and we have been foretelling it would occur for more than 20 years. And you know, just after World War II, almost nobody believed that West Germany would ever rise again. So Winston Churchill, that sage of diplomacy, said 50 years is what he thought it would take, and he had been there. He had viewed some of the shattered shards of once proud German cities of Essen and Mainz and Koblenz and Wuppertal and Köln and Bonn and Berlin itself, and people thought that that German nation could never once again emerge from the devastating destruction of World War II when those Allied bombers were busily flying back and forth and sometimes more than 1,000 plane raids. But we envisioned the creation of a united Europe, at least united economically and stable socially and politically, to help us withstand the growing red menace. The policy of encirclement was quite popular then, and Western planners called it a calculated risk, that is, the risk of rearming, as well as revitalizing industrially and economically, the nation of West Germany. Now, how, I ask you, could this program on radio, as it was then, and then later on in 1955 on television, and for years in the pages of the Plain Truth magazine, how could we have known that the United States of Europe was coming and that it would eventually embody ten nations? I'm not even saying that the nations that it embodies right now are the ones which eventually will be a part of the ultimate ten nations. But there will eventually be ten nations, a virtual recreation of an ancient Roman Empire, and I do not refer to people running around in sandals and togas and wielding Roman short swords, of course. I'm talking about a powerful, modern, space-age, third power block in the world which will gather under the shadow of its economic wings about one quarter of all of humankind, which with its about 265 to 290 million, depending on how you count it, which nations you're talking about, will actually be larger than either the Soviet Union or the United States. So you'll have, in essence, about four major power blocks, perhaps five. Uh, you could count Japan as one and China as two. The Soviet Union is three. The United States is four. And, of course, a United States of Europe is number five. Now, some people in the United States see this as a good sign. They say once that occurs, the United States of America can withdraw from policeman of the world position. And we won't have to emphasize the containment of communism and going to put out the brush fire wars here and there, a la Korea and Vietnam, ten years of protracted struggle. And instead, we can get back to that pre-World War II uh, diplomacy where we can perhaps look a little more to our own self-interest. And that has been occurring in the last ten years, a gradual withdrawal of the United States and a gradual expansion of Soviet power into the Indian Ocean, into the Mediterranean, the build-up of the Soviet fleet, in conventional forces and the like. But the point is, all of this was foretold centuries ago. It literally was foretold in the pages of your Bible. Now, when we first talked about a ten-nation United States of Europe in the days following World War II, absolutely no one believed it. I think the kindest comment a lot of people came up with was simply, that's nuts or words to that effect. But now there is a powerful West Germany at the head of powerful, revitalized, reindustrialized nations in Western Europe, and they are moving now toward full political union. And there will become a common currency eventually. Now, one full third of your Bible is prophecy. And if I could just color a Bible and page through it and show you where the prophecies, the prophetic sections are, you would be absolutely amazed at how much of it is prophecy, how much of it talks about our time right now. You know, the Bible is the bestseller that's almost never read. It's a kind of a status symbol in a lot of people's homes. The old brides carry it, usually white, with a little flower attached to it. It's in funeral parlors. I remember one funeral parlor. I walked in and sat down. We were arranging for the uh, funeral of a loved one, a family member. And I happen to glance at the Bible there, and you would certainly think that if any place would be logical and likely to place the Bible where it might be read, it would be in a funeral parlor where people were arranging the funerals for loved ones. But no, this one was perfectly clean, unmarked, not dog-eared, obviously not read. 
Some of the Bible societies, uh, the Gideons and others, have placed free Bibles in motel and hotel rooms all across the length and breadth of the United States, and for that matter, around the world. I don't know just what the exact ratio is, but I imagine you could check with most hotel owners and find out that they lose even TV sets and sheets and linens and everything imaginable, but they hardly ever lose one of those Bibles. You can pull it out of the drawer and look, and well, you once in a while you find a ring where somebody put a cocktail glass on it. It's useful for that. Once in a while you find where somebody burned the edge of it by letting a cigarette burn down too far. But when you look inside, you won't find very many notes, very many underlinings or a check mark or something that indicated somebody read something he thought was important and that had to do with our day right now today. So even though the United States of America is, in a sense, a religious country, a nation whose forefathers founded the country on biblical principle, on some of the laws of the Bible and some of the rights that are expressed of humanity and of one man to another, the golden rule and so on of the Bible, you don't find very many people are really literate where the Bible is concerned today. So while we have many Bibles in the land, very few people ever bother to read them. Now, you could take me up on a simple little thing if you don't want to uh, kill yourself socially. I suppose this could be called how to lose friends and antagonize people. But you grab a Bible, uh, get one that's well-worn and dog-eared, if you can go find one like that somewhere, and then just get on any public conveyance. Better yet, next time you take a trip, go to the... Uh, either bus station or if you're taking the train or to the air terminal and then board this conveyance and open up a Bible and sit there and read it and begin underlining it and act like you're really studying this thing. See what happens. I don't know whether people will act like you've got leprosy and whether they'll look at you as if with jaundiced eyes as if you're very strange, but uh, I don't think I can recall having seen anybody reading that book on a public conveyance. And some of them even have them in the reading racks. But coming to biblical prophecy, one of the most important things you can simply look at here is that you have to take two alternatives. When you look at Matthew 24, which is the heart and the focal point of Bible prophecy, you are left with two alternatives. If you have a Bible, why don't you turn to Matthew 24, and if not, well, you can just follow along and think about it for a minute. But here are those alternatives. Either Christ was a liar, either he was a complete fake, a fraud, a charlatan, and was talking in very pretentious terms about what might occur thousands of years later and clear on down into our time in, in the future, the age in which we live today, the space age, either he didn't mean a word he said, and the Bible is not true and cannot be trusted, or the second alternative is that much, almost all, of Matthew 24 has not happened yet and is just about to begin to happen right now in our time. Now, why do I say that and offer those two alternatives? Well, I take a look at Matthew 24. Jesus was at the temple. This is just prior to his crucifixion. And he went out and the, the disciples, you know, these were fishermen and carpenters and one was a tax collector and Luke was a physician. It didn't mean a medical doctor in our terminology, but one who dealt with various diets and herbs and whatnot who knew about the physical body and methods of uh, getting it in good health. The word physician doesn't necessarily mean a doctor in the modern medical terminology. And so they showed him the buildings of the temple. Like a lot of people from Kansas might take a look up, you know, New Yorkers like to watch the hicks and the sticks with their sore necks and looking up at the tall buildings. Well, these disciples were looking at the buildings of the temple, and they showed them to Christ, and he said, You see these things? I'm telling you the truth. There won't be one stone left here on top of another one that will not be thrown down. Now, let's stop right there, and let me tell you, in case you're unfamiliar with some of the uh, biblical scholars and their arguments about the Bible, many people have the attitude that Matthew 24, about the destruction of the temple, about all these calamities of famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and about religious martyrdom, were fulfilled when the armies of Titus finally took Jerusalem in about 70 A.D., and that part of the temple was destroyed. But here again you're left with this quandary. Jesus said, Not one stone shall be left on another that shall not be thrown down. Now, presently, there's a very large archaeological project right up that very same temple, likely right along the area, now covered with rubble, where these men walked at that time. 
And I'm here to tell you, because I've seen it with my own eyes, that not every one of those stones was thrown down, and the vast sections of the temple wall itself and some of the other buildings around still remain, and even though many of the stones were cast down and, you know, with crowbars and whatnot, tumbled down by the soldiers of the Roman army, there are many of those stones that still rest one conformably right on top of the other. So even that statement has not been fulfilled yet. He sat upon the Mount of Olives, up just down across the brook Kidron, which is now dry and up to the other top, and they were there in a kind of an olive grove privately where they used to go a lot. And the disciples finally got up there. They sat around and they asked privately, with all the people listening, tell us, when is all this going to happen? When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Now, you may not realize that back at the uh, siege of Corregidor, just as the defenders on the Bataan Peninsula were ready to give up, and the Japanese had broken through about the third last hastily erected defensive line, and they had unleashed this massive artillery barrage and started a lot of cane fields of fire. Many Americans and Filipinos were caught in a ring of fire and were virtually cremated. Just as they were about to surrender on the tip of the tan before Corregidor was taken, an earthquake struck, and many of those hardened, battle-worn, bloody veterans got on their knees and they thought the end of the world was here. In the black smog, the black fog of London back in the 50s, people dropped to their knees on the street because they thought the end of the world was here. Well, people misunderstand this business about the end of the world. The Greek word is cosmos, and it means an orderly society. It does not mean the destruction of the entirety of the globe, the earth, the land. It doesn't mean anything of the kind. And the Bible does not teach anything of the kind. It means merely the transition from one age into a new age. Now, you, a lot of you older people especially, have lived through the machine age, into the jet age, and now on into the space age. Many ages that we talk about in history. This that Christ talked about is the end of an age. As a matter of fact, some versions, modern English, render it that way. The consummation at the close of the age. It isn't talking about the destruction of the world. You might have heard of or seen some fellow with a long white robe walking to and fro in a public park among all of characters feeding the pigeon and he's got a sign in his back that says, flee from the wrath to come. There was one years ago in Los Angeles who thought he was Noah, another one who thought he was Jeremiah. I'd met sundry Elijahs and one guy who told me he was Christ himself and I didn't believe him. I, I just didn't believe him. I couldn't because he was wearing a brown suit and uh, he introduced himself and told me his name was Jesus Christ and I said, thanks a lot. I'll see you later. And he was on his way out of my office with my help very gently, and he said, Is this any way to receive me? I said, What gives you the idea I'm receiving you? I'm trying to help you out. And uh, there are people, however, who have gone about talking about the end of the world, the end of the globe itself, the destruction of the land surface. That isn't what Christ meant, and the Bible doesn't describe it that way. But the first thing he warned of was, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, how on earth can people come saying he is the Christ, not that they are, but that Jesus is the Christ, and still deceive people? How is it possible for someone to preach about Jesus Christ and still deceive somebody about his religion? Well, what have you heard about him mostly? You've heard that he was a vagabond, so like the first hippie, long brown locks flowing over his head. You've heard that he was... Uh, well, just about penniless, and that he slept in the field and had no place to live. You've probably heard a lot about his birth, and you've heard a lot about the Lord Jesus, and usually with a certain tone of voice that uh, is rather strange. And you wonder, where do these people go to learn that, and do they all go to the same school? Politicians generally seem to sound a little bit alike, and preachers generally seem to sound a little bit alike. And you ever notice how it's getting increasingly difficult to tell one from the other? A lot of times politicians begin to make noises almost like preachers, and sometimes they begin to promise virtually the same thing, as far as that's concerned. Promise you a kind of a uh, millennium or a heaven on earth right here and now. But it's rather wonder why it is that people, while they've heard a message about the things Jesus did, or about his birth, or about his death, that very few have heard very much about what he said. Now, if I were to tell you, for example, that Christ had short hair, and you can prove it by the Bible, that he was of the tribe of Judah, which means he was a Jew, that he was a common-looking man, so common, in fact, that he had the 
He picked out of a crowd by the Judas kiss at an enormous sum to be bribed for that, and many times escaped out of the midst of a crowd where they were after him to kill him. So he looked like any other ordinary man of his day, that he was a property owner and a taxpayer, and that he was a powerfully built man who labored with his hands most of his life. Is that I merely ask, because I can prove that from the Bible and have many times, not only orally and in classes and whatnot, but have written articles on it to absolutely prove that. He had his own house in Capernaum, and it was large enough for 120 people to get in one large upstairs room. But you know, that doesn't quite square with what you thought about him. Just as it doesn't square that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was a prophet, and that he talked about our day. Now here in Matthew 24 is a fantastic description of our day, and it's dated irrevocably. There's no way around it. There was no way to even understand the scripture until the beginning of the atomic and the hydrogen era. It's found in Matthew 24 and verse 21 and 2. And it says, and these are in Jesus' own words, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. So it's unparalleled in the history of humankind. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. So he talked of a time when it was actually possible to annihilate the entirety of all of humanity. And that has never before been possible until this space age, this age of atomic and hydrogen bomb stockpiling, where we have overkill, where we could literally annihilate 50 worlds like ours, one after another. So the very first thing Jesus said, as I was going to mention to you, highlights what is said back in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, where you read about the horsemen of the apocalypse. This has puzzled people for many, many years. Take a look at the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation for a moment. He said, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four living creatures, as it should read, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, if you knew a little bit about the Bible, but not a lot about the Bible, you might think, Oh, yeah, Christ is always pictured as riding on a white horse. So that surely means Jesus Christ. But when you read of the other horsemen, the red one, the bay, or the grizzled one, the black horse, and so on, and then you go back to Matthew 24 and read the time order of the events, you will find that Jesus interprets the sixth chapter of Revelation by what he said in Matthew 24. So let's take a look at that. Matthew 24, the very first thing he warned his disciples to watch for was false Christ, was religious confusion and deception, the deception of many... And the very first horseman of the mysterious four horsemen of the apocalypse is a white horse, someone who has a crown and a bow who goes out to conquer. Now, how in the world are you going to recognize who is right and who is wrong? How are you going to do exactly as Jesus said and take heed that no man deceive you? A little later on in the same chapter, Matthew 24 and verse 11, he said, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, he said, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Why did Jesus warn continually about false prophets and false Christ? Religions of the world are divided up into hundreds and hundreds of different sects. There are all the major religions, the minor religions. Christianity, so-called, is divided into more than 400 differing denominations each saying it gets what it believes out of the Bible, and yet each one disagreeing with the other, and sometimes even uh, really squabbling with one another, and writing nasty articles back and forth, and attacking one another and the like. You can't really find uh, very much more of a record of viciousness than you can back through history of one religion attacking another religion, or a people who were filled with a religious notion trying to convert the heathens and the savages. So how are you going to know? How are you going to check and approve yourself? He said that many will be deceived. Now, how do you know I'm not going to deceive you? Well, the answer is you don't, unless you prove it to yourself with your own eyes. That's why on this program, I am determined to show you from time to time scriptures that point out some of the most important things in your Bible 
and try to interest you enough to get you to blow the dust off your own Bible at home, open it up and begin to prove some of these things to yourself. You can't believe me just because I tell you something any more than you can believe even what you hear in the newspapers or hear over radio or television news. You have to take it out with a little bit of a grain of salt because sometimes things are reported inaccurately. Maybe no intent, no motive involved. Maybe it's just a matter that the news didn't quite get there the way it should have been. So I say don't believe anybody. Listen without prejudice to anybody you wish. But then go to the source and check it for yourself and believe what you see proved in your own Bible. And then you won't go wrong. But the very first thing that Christ warned of was false Christ, false prophets, he said there would be many, not just a few. I oftentimes like to think of the mainstream of the Christian religions and think that they're all right, that everybody is right. And people have always said, well, now, how can, can all these churches be wrong? Well, it makes far more sense to ask, how can all these churches be right? If any one of them is right, Let's just reason together for a minute. If any one of them, I mean this very sincerely, is right, all the way right, 100% right, then none of the others can be. Well, why is that? Well, because every one of them differs in certain major, if not major, than many minor points of doctrine. Now, maybe the way to heaven has a dozen different uh, doors, a dozen different methods of getting there. I never could figure why people wanted to go to heaven. You can see how shocking it's going to be if they're halfway there and they meet Christ coming the other way. Now, you know, I can just imagine that scene. People are hurtling up to heaven by the millions, great mass of people on their way to heaven, and here comes Jesus, true to all the prophecies, true to what he said, true to the first message that ever came back to the earth after he departed, that he shall so come in like manner as you've seen him leave, that he's coming back to the earth, the Matthew 24 that talks about his return to the earth. So they're on their way to heaven, and here comes Christ on his way back to the earth, and they say, hold it, where are you going? He says, well, I'm going down to earth where I told everybody I was going. Where are you going? And they might say, well, we're going to heaven. He says, no, you're not. No, you're not. I told you time and again that no man is ascended to heaven. Peter told you on the day of Pentecost in the second chapter of the book of Acts, the very first recorded lengthy sermon in the entirety of the New Testament, that David is dead and buried in the sepulcher is with us to this day. And then went on to really drive the nail in the coffin by saying, David is not ascended into the heavens. And that was after the resurrection of Christ. So if you think he was in some special compartment, kind of reserved to wait there, his soul, you know, crying for release until Christ made it possible, how come... David wasn't up there. David, a man after God's own heart, who was used to write about as much of the Bible as anybody, one of the greatest kings in all of the history of Israel, one of the greatest and most central figures of the entirety of the Bible in biblical history, a man of whom it is said will be resurrected to judge his own people Israel. And yet the New Testament says, Peter says, under inspiration of Christ, that David is not ascended into the heavens. You know, you begin to wonder where we get some of these ideas. Where did we get the notion in the first place that anybody was going to go to heaven? I've heard people say the Bible says you're going to heaven. But where does it say that? That's all you ask. Where does the Bible say you are going to heaven? I know very well. The Apostle Paul said he desired to depart and be with Christ. But, you know, the Apostle Paul was the one who was inspired to write the resurrection chapter of the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul there talked about the hope of the dead. He said, if Christ is not risen, then is our faith reigned. He talked continually about a resurrection. In the early chapters of the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul was found preaching through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Paul was a great believer in the resurrection. He talked about it continually. He didn't believe at all in going to heaven because he talked about the reward which Christ would bring with him to the earth from heaven. Now, you ought to write for this article we have on just what is the reward of the faith. Maybe that sounds like a, a religious title. But after all, it's kind of a religious subject when you start thinking about it, this business of going to heaven. You know, I said time and again that people want to be saved from something right here on the earth. If people have economic difficulty, they want money. If people have got a disease, they want to get rid of it. If they got a fever, they want a lower temperature. If they're cold, they want to get warm. If they're sinking in a bog, they want to get saved from it by a rope or a limb or something. 
And at that time in your life, when you're about to face a terrible emergency, you're ready for something other than somebody saying, Blessings be upon you, my child, you're saved. You want a rope, you know. You want a thermometer. You want a doctor or somebody to help you out of your difficulty. So what does Jesus Christ of Nazareth offer people? He offers them a better life here and now, as well as life for all eternity. He offers them life and life more abundantly. Jesus Christ of Nazareth came with a message about Christian duty, about responsibility, about character development, about obedience to God, about living a life of overcoming and developing into a full-blown, mature, well-grounded, well-rounded, thinking human being who has a love of mercy more than justice, who has a desire to give instead of take, who wants to serve and help his fellow human being instead of steal from him. And what is all of this for? Christian retirement? Suddenly after somebody is overcome by dint of hard effort and hours in prayer and blood and sweat and tears, does he suddenly get wafted off up to heaven when his body dies? You know, when you stop to think about it, you and I don't believe in going to heaven. I don't care how many people profess to. Because you've never seen anybody stand around and rejoice about time it was Uncle Harry's turn to die. You know, it reminds me of the, the, this old Jewish fellow who was lying on his deathbed. Maybe you've heard this record. And he was kind of wheezing away and talking to one of the young fellows there. And he was saying, Where is everybody, you know? And the kid said, Well, they're all in the other room, Father. And he said, What is that I smell? And they said, it's Mother's Apple Strudel, Father. He says, oh, to die with the taste of Mama's Apple Strudel on my lips. <laughs> Gasping away sounds horrible. It's one of these kind of a party records. And the kid says, I'm sorry, Father, but Mother says it's for after the funeral. Now, you know, that's just not good news to the poor old fellow. He's lying there about to die. And he smells the pie or the apple strudel being cooked, and he is told, well, that's for after you die. I've never yet seen a wake held before the person departed. Have you ever yet seen anybody who was about to die where the whole family and everybody else was rejoicing? The most eloquent sermon that's ever been preached to preach somebody in the heaven after he has died has barely made a dent in the tears of the, of the ones that are still living and standing huddled around the coffin. People really innately deep down in themselves still wonder about it. Let me tell you, you don't need to wonder. I'll tell you where people are going when they die. Six feet under. And that's where they're going to stay until Jesus Christ of Nazareth comes to this earth and they are resurrected. So if you want to write for this book on the modern Romans and also ask for an article on the resurrection while you're at it, you'll find something very, very, very surprising, I'm sure. And I'm not asking you to believe it because I tell you, you look into your own Bible and prove it to yourself. Write for this book that the modern Romans, the decline of Western civilization, just mentioned the Romans book it, the modern Romans, the decline of Western civilization. It showed how agriculture was in trouble, the economy was in trouble, joblessness became rampant, and the military even threatened insurgents or the overthrow of government. This book of the modern Romans will put you in the picture in modern-day United States of America, Canada, Britain, Australia, South Africa, and other countries, and show you how our Western English-speaking world is going the way of ancient Rome. It's free of charge, it's graphically illustrated, it has full-color pictures throughout, and it costs you nothing. All you need to do is to tell us the name of the radio station to which you've been listening, and then send your request to Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales. The address is Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales. Remember, there is no price. There's no advertising in any of the literature I've mentioned. It's free of charge. The address again is Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales. Until next time, this is Garner Chodon Strong saying goodbye, friends. You have been listening to The World Tomorrow. If you would like more information, write to Ambassador College, Box 345, GPO, Sydney, New South Wales. That's Ambassador College, Box 345, GPO Sydney, New South Wales.
Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.